am convinced today that the more knowledge we have about marriage and marital relationships, the more books we have on the subject, the more preaching and teaching we have on marriage and marital relationship, the more we focus on marriage and marital relationship, the more we see marriages in trouble. Now, I understand, of course, that every culture, I understand that every generation have their own challenges. I understand that. That is normal. And we do have our own challenges. And I thank God for those who preach and teach and counsel. I'm not against any of that. I want to submit to you today that the more we make a science out of marriage relationship, other than obedience to the Word of God, the further we move away from the solutions to the problem, the more accommodation we make to the symptoms of the problem, the further we get away from the cure to the problem. The more we focus on the peripheries, the further we get away from the center and the core of the problem. So what is the problem? Sin. Somebody already said it. Sin. That is really the problem. That's the core of the problem. It's sin. And until we are willing to call sin, sin, we are exasperating the problem. Let me illustrate. Whenever I act selfishly toward my wife, I can get all the secular counseling in the world. I can get even the pastor counseling. And they can tell me why I am selfish. <laughs> They can tell me the specific times in which I am more likely to be selfish. They can tell me all the psychological reasons for my selfishness. They can tell me about the events and the circumstances in my life that triggers my selfishness. All of this analysis is going to do one thing. I can tell you. All it's going to do is going to get me in a merry-go-round, and merry-go-round, and merry-go-round, and merry-go-round, merry-go-round. And it's not dealing with the core of my problem. <laughs> and the core of my problem is what? Sin. And that in itself is a huge problem. That's the cause of all problems. Because if I call it sin, of course that requires of me to ask for forgiveness to repent and to seek the strength of the Lord not to do this again. But instead, what I'm tempted to do, what I'm tempted to do is conceal my sin. While in reality, there's only one way to deal with it. And that is to confess it, repent of it, and seek the power of God to overcome it. That's it. But instead, what we do with our marital problems as we go around and around and around and around, often wasting months or even years, months or even years that could have been spent in joy and happiness, wasting months or even years in trying to prove that the other one is wrong. When you simply, I'm sorry, I've sinned, forgive me, would have taken care of the problem. <laughs> and I love this poet uh, by the name of Ogden Nash, he, he put it this way. Listen to what he said. He said, you know, if you want your marriage to sizzle with love in the loving cup, whenever you're wrong, admit it. Whenever you're right, shut up. <laughs> Isn't that great? I love that. Yeah, you like me. Just stay forward. You know, I was reading this week, as a matter of fact, a story. I thought I'd share it with you. It's really exciting. It's so wonderful. It just illustrates the point that I'm trying to make. This farmer and his wife were going to town, and one of the things we're going to do in town is that he was going to get his physical. And so she went with him. Of course, she wanted to know what's going on. So she patiently, the wife sat outside while the doctor examined him. And after examination, the doctor called her in and wanted to meet with her in his office one-on-one. -on -one. And he said to her, I said, listen, there are certain things that you must do or your husband 
most surely will die. Oh, can you imagine? Her fear gripped her heart, and, and she began to panic, and so he hands her the list. And so she quietly sits there and reads the list. Number one, fix your husband a hot breakfast every morning before he goes out to milk the cows at 5 o'clock. Number two, surprise him with a homemade pie or cake every day at lunchtime. Number three, after lunch, insist that he would lie down in the hammock to take a nap. Number four, bring him the newspaper when he wakes out of his nap and a glass of freshly squeezed lemonade. <laughs> Number five, always let him have the remote control <laughs> and watch the ball game whenever he wants to. Well, she read this note and then she folded it, put it in her purse, and they were sitting in the car and driving home. And, and the husband turned to the wife and said, uh, He said, well, What did the doctor say? She just thought for a minute and she said, Well, he said that you're most surely going to die. <laughs> uh, amen. <laughs> I want you to turn with me, please, to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Today's The Truth About is in the series we've looked in three weeks, The Truth About Love, and today we're going to talk about the truth about intimacy in marriage. You know, the Corinthian Christians were so confused about this whole question of intimacy in marriage. They were so confused about it, so much so that some of them were acting selfishly toward each other in the home between husband and wife. They were so confused that some of them were acting ignorantly in their relationships. And still others had fallen into the moral corruption of the culture of the day. And so they sat down, the congregation sat down and wrote the Apostle Paul a letter that prompts the Apostle Paul to write back in response the truth about intimacy in marriage, which is the subject of today. But I want you to remember this. They did not have 2,000 years of Christian history as we do. But here's the sad part, is that we seem to be making a full circle to paganism just as the days of the Apostle Paul. And the Greek worldview in the first century, they believed that everything that is physical, and that includes the body, the human body, is evil. And consequently, if it is evil, is of no value. In fact, the Greeks used to say that the body is merely the prison that imprisons the soul. I want you to hear me right, please. It's very important. This is a lie from the pit of hell. And because it is a lie from the pit of hell, you're going to find that whoever and whenever you think of the body as evil, when you think of the human body as bad, you're going to react in two different ways. Both are godless, both unbiblical, both are sinful. You're either going to do one of these two things. Either you're going to be driven to asceticism on the one hand or to an extreme self-indulgence of the body on the other. These two extremes that the natural man is driven to, if they do not have a biblical understanding, a Godward understanding of the human body, and that's what's happening today. People abuse their bodies because... They see no value in them. They don't understand that God created the body so beautifully so that His Holy Spirit may dwell in it. And the Holy Spirit does not dwell in junk. Amen? Amen. So, here's this pagan thinking. You've got a bunch of people in Corinth, either with asceticism or into self-indulgence, and the gospel of Jesus Christ comes in and is proclaimed to the Corinthians saying, The body is good! God created the body, and He created it for His glory. 
that the body is created for the Holy Spirit of God to dwell in it. That the very purpose of the creation of the body is for the glory of God. And therefore, both asceticism on the one hand and self-indulgence on the other are contrary to God's plan. Both of these extremes pervert the purpose for which God created the body. And so Paul begins. We look at verses 1 and 2, 1 Corinthians 7, saying, It is good for a man... Now here's the accurate translation. Are you ready for it? Not to touch a woman. That's the literal translation. It is good for a man not to touch a woman. But before you get feeling guilty, let me, let me just go on to explain this. When Paul says it is good for a man not to touch a woman, that is a euphemism that was understood at the time, and it's even understood in some cultures today, in some languages today, to mean sexual intercourse. That's what it means. It's a euphemism. The NIV tried to sanitize it and tried to spiritualize it and say it's good for a man not to marry a woman, but in reality, Paul is talking about intimacy. Here's what Paul is saying. If you are a single, rejoice in your singleness. Don't let anybody look down upon your singleness. In fact, he talks more about this than the rest of the chair. You can read it when you go home. And he is saying, if you are single, then trust the living God with His supernatural power dwelling in you to give you the strength to remain sexually chaste while you're single. Because intimacy is a wonderful gift of God, but it's supposed to be only exercised in marriage. In a marriage between husband and wife. Period. But if you're married, and that's really the answer to the question, and that's really what the subject of today. He said, if you're married, then you have certain obligations one to another. Of course, that is easily said than done. What are these obligations? Well, verse 3, it says, The husband, by the way, I gave my wife an equal time for rebuttal. She said, No, she agrees with everything I say. So, <laughs> is she wonderful? <laughs> he says, The husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife and likewise the wife to the husband. Other than physical illness, the one thing that hinders husbands and wives from meeting their spouse's needs is what? Sin. You got it. God bless you. The number one barrier between husband and wife in intimacy is sin. How does it work? Well, listen. Often this is how it works. 34 years experience. I am not giving you this from a book, let me tell you. It comes out of my experience. The wife says, my husband wants me to affirm him and build him up. Oh, but before I do that, he's got to grovel and crawl and, and, and accommodate to me. The husband says, my wife wants me to love her and appreciate her. Well, that's good. But <laughs> she has to stop being prickly and bristly all the time. That's wrong. The wife says, my husband wants me to respect him. That's good. But he's got to earn my respect. That's wrong. <laughs> the husband says, my wife wants me to honor her. Well, that's good. I will do that if she stops nagging me all the time. And that's wrong. Now, wives, please listen to me. I'm going to let you on a secret. <laughs> what would you know? I, I do know. It is not a sin for you to boost your husband's ego. It is not a sin for you to build him up. It is not a sin to affirm his God-given gifts. It is not a sin to fulfill his needs for intimacy. Actually, the opposite is true. It is a sin to withhold these things from him. You know when the Bible said, 
Wives, submit to your husbands. And all the people who hate God and hate the church and hate the Bible said, Oh, you see, Christianity says a wife must lie down and become a, a doormat. Hogwash. That's not what the Bible says at all. When the Bible says that, he's saying to the wives, affirm your husband, respond to your husband, react to your husband in a positive way. The Bible did not say, do that only if he keeps his end of the bargain. No, no, no. You do it. Period. Now, husbands, are you ready for some secrets? It is not a sin for you to discipline yourself <laughs> to listen. Hello. Listen to your wife. It is not a sin to recognize that when your wife is telling you about a problem, that she does not necessarily, is not looking for solutions. Man, that is hard. We as men are problem solvers, and we want to jump and take charge and fix everything. With two wonderful daughters and a magnificent wife, in the last 34 years, I have learned the hard way. When they tell you about a problem, they don't want you to solve it. Listen to me. I even now, I, I'm a, at my age, I'm learning that when I listen to a problem, before I jump, I say, oh, by the way, do you want me to help solve this problem? <laughs> you know, I mean, or do you want me to just listen? They'll tell you. They'll tell you. Just ask. Just ask. Listen, it is not a sin when you find your wife in a muddle that she's not looking for a rescuer. She's looking for somebody to affirm her. It is not a sin to remind your wife daily that next to your salvation, she is the greatest gift that God has given you. It is not a sin to continuously assure your wife of your undying love for her. In fact, the opposite is true. Not doing these things is a sin. Now, wives, remember, you know, growing up in the Middle East, I used to think this is a Middle Eastern culture thing about the way to a man's heart is his stomach because I saw a lot of fat Egyptian men. And <laughs> And I just thought, well, you know, this must be a cultural thing until I start going elsewhere in Australia, living here, and said, so that is, goes across cultural. It's a saying somehow made it worldwide. <laughs> it's a fallacy, let me tell you. It is absolute fallacy. I don't care what men say. That is just not true. But let me tell you the way to a man's heart. You wanna, do you want to hear it? The way to a man's heart is his ego. God created your husbands, ladies, with an ego. He did this, you can argue with him in heaven, but that's what he did, okay? <laughs> and he created you with the ability to stroke his ego. And he created you with the ability verbally to stroke his ego. Listen, God will take care of his head. It's not going to get swollen because God has ways of dealing with us men. So leave that to God. Amen? Now husbands, particularly young husbands, I want you to listen to me. Young husbands. I know some of you old timers, this is old hat to you, but that's all right. Let me talk to young husbands. Do you know the way to your wife's heart? The way to your wife's heart is to continuously assure her of your love for her. That's the way to your wife's heart. It's not that they suffer from amnesia. <laughs> We're close to it. <laughs> but listen, listen, listen. It doesn't matter. That's none of your business. It's not my business. You do it anyway. Whether they remember or not, it doesn't matter. That's not your business. Your business is to keep on affirming her. Keep on blessing her. God created her as an emotional being. And she needs you, husbands, to remind her 
often of her worth, of her value. The Corinthians were so confused in this whole issue of intimacy, and Paul is telling them that intimacy is not only a privilege and a pleasure, but it is a sacred responsibility. So many Christians, for some reason, don't understand this. I hope that you will today. You've heard the words, and people say, well, it's my body, and I do what I want with it. Well, I'm not going to get into this, but I can tell you something, that if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, that is a fallacy. That is not true. Your body does not belong to you. It belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what the Word of God said. He says, your body is not your own, but belongs to the Lord. And that's why I said earlier, when you have the wrong view of your body, you are either going to be driven into asceticism on the one hand or ridiculous self-indulgence on the other. But in marriage, for believers, your body not only belongs to the Lord, but also belongs to your spouse. You have surrendered pleasing yourself the day you said, I do. I know we tell jokes about people getting cold feet in the last minute and all this. I remember in the early days when I was a young, young minister, and I, you know, I was kind of joking with the guy before we came up to the, to the, to the wedding, and, and I said, this is your last chance. And he said to me, really? I said, no, 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 I'm joking. <laughs> he was about to take me up on it. Forget it, I've never done that again. <laughs> I, know, I know we joke about these things, and, 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 and we say, you know, that the honeymoon is that period between I do and you better, but, <laughs> but, but in reality, there is really no joke. There is no joke. It's a sacred responsibility to meet each other's need for intimacy. It's sacred. It's holy. And not to surrender to each other in intimacy is dishonoring to the Lord above all. The command of Paul here is very clear. Stop depriving one another unless it is for a period of time and by mutual agreement. And what does that mean? It means that one spouse cannot go spiritual on the other. Don't play that spiritual game. Paul is saying no spouse should try to use intimacy to manipulate the other spouse. He's saying one spouse cannot force deprivation on the other spouse. Paul is saying that there are times in the life of a couple when they have to fast and pray for an issue in their life or their family. There are times in the life of a couple when they have to be abstained from intimacy, forgo intimacy, for spiritual reason. But, listen, this is, a, this, this is very important, but only by mutual consent, not by edict, <laughs> Not by mood, not by revenge, and not by punishment. Why? Paul said that when one makes the decision alone, without the complete agreement of the other spouse, without the complete agreement of the two, you are opening up your marriage to Satan to come in and create havoc in your marriage and temptation. Intimacy in marriage is a gift from God. And when one acts independent of the other, when one decides alone, when one acts without the agreement of the other, you are not only perverting that great gift of God. Yes, you heard me right. You are not only perverting that great gift of God, but you are jeopardizing answers to your prayer. First Peter chapter 3 makes it very clear. When the husband and wife are not on the same page, 
the prayers will be hindered. The prayers will be hindered. And so, I come full circle to what I began. When I act selfishly toward my wife, all of the counseling in the world will not help me. All the preaching in the world will not help me. All the pastors in the world will not help me. What I need to do is to identify my sin of selfishness, confess it to the Lord and to my wife, repent of it, and seek the Lord's forgiveness and the power to overcome selfishness. Beloved, I want to tell you something. I know and you know that the enemy is working overtime on Christian marriages. And it is by the power of God that we're going to defeat him. Amen. If you'd like to learn how to know God in a personal way, ask for the booklet, Finding the Joy You've Always Wanted. It will tell you of God's love for you and explain how to experience his forgiveness. have a personal relationship with God and you're interested in walking closer with Him, the booklet Seven Steps in Your Faith Adventure will help guide you into a deeper fellowship with your Heavenly Father. Ask for your free booklet.